welcome to the 700 Club. It's bedlam at the border. The immigrant crisis is blowing up in Biden's face. So who is the president putting in charge to stop the surge? It's interesting. It used to be the Bush administration. It was the Reagan administration. It was the uh, Obama administration. Now it is the Biden-Harris administration. And on several so-called Freud and slips, the president has called Kamala Harris the president. He's called her President Harris. Well, she's now in charge of this entire border thing. And 18 senators are also headed to the Rio Grande Valley to see for themselves what's going on. Meanwhile, who's exploiting this escalating crisis? Heather Sells has that. As the border crisis escalates, President Biden is putting the vice president in charge. When she speaks, she speaks for me, doesn't have to check with me. She knows what she's doing. The work will not be easy, uh, but it is important work. The president blames former President Trump for the mess, which has led to 16,000 children in U.S. border custody. But Trump ally Lindsey Graham says the Trump's Biden administration has lost this. control. This is not Trump's fault. That's a bunch of BS. This is poly cho policy choices that were ill-conceived that have blown up in Biden administration's face. Just released Border Patrol video shot last week reveals cramped conditions. This facility, meant to hold 250 people, now bursting with close to 4,000. Children seen sleeping on the floor under foil blankets. And now, The Hill reporting 300 children in custody with COVID who must be isolated. On Wednesday, members of Congress toured a new facility for unaccompanied teens. On Friday, 18 senators will visit the Rio Grande Valley to see for themselves what's happening. A Trump public health order allows the U.S. to quickly return adults and families stopped at the border. But Axios reports that Homeland Security numbers show officials sent back fewer than 15 percent of families last week. So these are people literally crossing the border illegally as adults that are being released into the country or that are 17 years old, that they're actually transitioning to another relative that's in the country also illegally and saying show up for a court hearing two years from now, which obviously most of those folks don't show up for the hearings. Senator Graham said Wednesday that cartels are taking advantage of U.S. asylum policies, promising the very poor and desperate they'll have no problem qualifying. Graham's new bill would force them to apply for asylum in their home countries. The asylum system is being gamed. The Secure and Protect Act will stop this. In recent weeks, the administration has made more than 10,000 beds available near the border with plans to open new facilities, including military bases in Texas to house teenagers. Heather Sells, CBN News. Listen, America cannot afford to take hundreds of millions of people, the poor and the needy all over the world, and, and make them citizens. We can't afford it. It'll ruin our country. <clears throat> but Biden has said, I guess they, they want these people to be voters in the Democratic Party or something. But anyhow, he's, he's opened the border, and they know they're welcome here, and he's not going to stop them. And he, all he's got to do is say no longer, and he makes a deal with Mexico, that the people get returned to the country from whence they came. But it isn't that way. That's the way it was under Trump, and we didn't have this crisis. But it is a humanitarian disaster building on our border. Why? Because of the words of the sitting president. Well, in other news, that same president has waited longer than any of his predecessors in more than 100 years. Today, Joe Biden will take the podium in the White House press room. So what can we expect? John Jessup has more on that story. That is right, Pat. On his 64th day in office, President Biden holds his very first press conference. This long-awaited event prompted by questions about why it's taken so long for him to stand before reporters and answer rapid-fire questions. CBN White House correspondent Eric Phillips reports. 
The president's long-awaited appearance could be one of the most analyzed, given all the talk leading up to it. It will be seen as a test of his ability to think on his feet under pressure, a test some claim Biden has purposely avoided, though the White House says he's just been laser-focused on his agenda for America. Before God and all of you, I give you my word. I will always level with you. It's a promise brought up often by the president and his team. When the president asked me to serve in this role, we talked about the importance of bringing truth and transparency back to the briefing room. But some insist that hasn't happened. Why hasn't he answered questions from the press at this point? Is it just that he's too busy? I think he's answered questions, I, I believe the count is almost 40 times. So, uh, and I would say that his focus, again, is on getting recovery and relief to the American people. During a recent interview with ABC News, the president was seemingly candid. So you know Vladimir Putin, you think he's a killer? Mm-hmm, I do. So what price must he pay? The price he's going to pay, well, you'll see shortly. He was very direct. Yeah. On every, every single issue. But some say a calm one-on-one -on -one or answering shouted questions while walking is not the same as facing the media music in the briefing room. The president is uh, somebody who has been kept on a pr pretty tightly uh, constricted messaging streak lately. He hasn't yet to hold a single official press conference. That is now officially the longest a sitting U.S. president has gone without a press conference in over 100 years. Many have speculated as to why. Some wondering if the West Wing is leery of the president making gaffes like this one. And I want to thank the, the, the uh, former general, I keep calling him general, but my, my, uh, the guy who runs that outfit over there. Whatever the reason for the timing, it sends a message for many that is opposite of transparent, especially when the White House won't call a crisis at the border a crisis. Children who are frightened and crying, overcrowded conditions. Now that the public has seen that, is that not a crisis? Well, children uh, presenting at our border who are fleeing violence, who are fleeing prosecution, who are fleeing terrible situations, is not a crisis. When will reporters be allowed to tour facilities holding children who cross the southern border? We remain committed to transparency. CBN political analyst David Brody says during today's press conference, he and others will be watching and listening to the questions as much as the answers. Because I think there's gonna be a lot of scrutiny as to who he's calling on and what type of questions are asked. I do expect obviously quite a few stumbles by, from Joe Biden, but the bar couldn't be any lower for Joe Biden. Unfortunately, that's not a good thing. During the campaign, critics said the president employed a, quote, basement strategy of not leaving his home for live events. Due to COVID, some said that might have been acceptable for a candidate. But now that he's president, there is little appetite for even the hint of avoiding the media. Pat. Uh, Eric, uh, what expectations do you think the president's got to meet in order to satisfy the American people? I think there are a few of them, Pat. First of all, the president will need to come off as presidential tonight, right? That means appearing in a way that is competent, alert, knowledgeable, really on his game, something that could be difficult for him given his penchant for gaffes. Uh, he needs to come up with real, tangible answers for the American people tonight. I would also say he needs to demonstrate to the American people that he has stamina and endurance to last these next four years. Remember, we are just at the beginning of his administration. There's a long way to go with several crises we're dealing with right now. People need to be reassured that he is in this for the long haul, that he can go the distance. And then he needs to come off as a consoler. To that point, there are several things happening right now. We're talking about two mass shootings in the last week, uh, a situation at the border. Also, uh, people are hurting uh, based on a lot of other factors, economic and COVID-related. The president really needs to come off as compassionate, which could be good for him because that tends to be his strong suit, Pat. Uh, you know, Eric, we mentioned before, but on the White House web page and administration press releases, they're now calling it the Biden-Harris administration. I don't believe any last president has done anything like that. What do you make of it? Well, 
Pat, I think there are really two schools of thought where this is concerned. The first is that the White House is really trying to highlight that team effort between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, right? In some ways, maybe resembling the lockstep relationship that Joe Biden enjoyed with his former boss, uh, President Barack Obama, but taking it a step further. The second thought is that this could be an early setup for a 2024 run for Harris, assuming the president does not run for a second term, sort of a way to elevate her role. And remember, just yesterday, she was appointed to sort of honcho this immigration situation at the border right now. So we're seeing her profile rise. Perhaps all of this was even pre-established before they were inaugurated. That's just speculation, but we don't know for sure. What we do know is that this story will be told in the days to come, and we'll be following it very closely. Well, one last question real quick. Uh, you know, the 25th Amendment says if a president's incompetent, they, they can, uh, there are various steps that can be made to take him out. Do you think that's in the offing? Do you hear any rumors of that up there? Not hearing any rumors of that so far. Again, there have been several gaffes. We've seen them all. Uh, some of them have even been made into jokes. So we saw the president stumbling up the stairs of Air Force One here in just a few days ago. And so there are some concerns that maybe he's not as alert as some folks would like him to be. But whether or not that really translates into some sort of cognitive impairment, some sort of medical uh, or medically verified situation where the president is concerned, haven't heard really a lot of rumors rumors about that, and certainly not anything that would elevate to the level of Congress taking action to remove him at this point. But again, time will tell that story as well, Pat. Okay, thanks, Eric. Thanks for your reporting. John? Well, Pat, Congress is clashing over proposed election reform. The Senate holding hearings Wednesday on its version of the House passed H.R. 1 for the People Act. This week, big names in politics and media came to Regent University to address election integrity, particular that House passed bill. Paul Strand reports. Regent's new dean for the School of Government kicked off the conference. Former Congresswoman Michelle Bachman said America can't allow national elections to be stolen. Without an honest count of votes, we won't have a way to remove leaders that we don't want. And we won't have a way to get rid of laws that we don't like. Instead, a permanent group of elites will ensure their own continued power. And that will require you and me to live the way the elites tell us to. Keynote speaker Ben Carson said he's appalled how people are being shut up now if they want any fraud wiped out going forward. Even speaking about having honest and morally principled elections causes all kinds of uproars today. A panel of election experts ripped into H.R. 1, a bill the Senate's now considering the detractors say would be a federal takeover of state election laws. It basically throws open the vote to almost anyone who wants to pretend that they have a right to vote, who can vote twice, uh, who can vote from out of state, uh, who can vote if they're dead. Look, I believe in respect for our dead, but I also believe that we should have no representation without respiration. It's just one bad provision after another. The, the whole intent of this law appears to be uh, to make it easy to cheat, to make it easy to get away with it, and to make it uh, almost impossible to detect or prosecute. I like to say that H.R. 1 is unworkable, it's immoral, and it's unconstitutional. Sometimes I refer to that as the swamp trifecta. Uh, that's Washington, D.C. for you. It's all a partisan power grab. There's not a single, not a single good idea in this entire 900-page bill. And political commentator Mark Stein worries H.R. 1 could permanently warp American elections and democracy. This is a recipe for a permanent one-party swamp which is the ruling party and a controlled opposition in permanent minority status. Stein suggests half the country permanently disenfranchised could be a powder keg. Where we have groups of people who simply do not want to be in the same country uh, with the other group. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. Pat, it looks like this was a pretty successful event. The, the response I'm, I'm reading about it, it it looked like it was a, a home run with the bases loaded. I mean, it's sure really right? been. A, yes. I mean, it was a, a wonderful thing. And Michelle Bachman is just extraordinary. She is now the dean of 
the, name, the school is named after my father, the Robertson School of Government, and she is doing it. But this conference is fantastic, so my congratulations. It, it, hey, by the way, Regent is an incredible school. We'll be talking about it later on in the program, but uh, uh, I happen to be the chancellor of it, and I'm very proud of what they're doing. But this, this is one more example. We have the former chief judge of the North Carolina Supreme Court, and his assistant the dean was head of all of the courts in North Carolina. Um, and uh, we have uh, three circuit court judges as adjunct faculty, plus one Supreme Court judge. Wow. I mean, it's quite a school. You've heard of Beauty and the Beast. Well, she's a beauty with a beast of a background. Asia Branch dreamed of escaping her troubled childhood after her father was sent to prison. Her dreams came true when she captured the Miss USA crown. Recently, Charlene Aaron visited with Asia about how she's using the power of her redemptive story to inspire others. Growing up, Asia Branch wanted to escape a troubled childhood. That led to the dream of becoming Miss USA. A true long shot, she never imagined making history on two fronts, becoming the first black woman to be crowned Miss Mississippi and the first from her state to win the national title. Mississippi has never won Miss USA before. And so I, <laughs> going into the competition, I was just like, wow, I could make history again. This response to a question on gun control during last November's competition clinched her win gun laws. Education should be available to everyone. I believe that we should require people to pass training and safety courses before they're allowed to purchase a gun and before re um, receiving a permit. I think it's important that we not ban guns because obviously people will find a way to get what they want anyways, but I think it's our second amendment right and we, we just need more safety surrounding that. Miss USA 2020 is Mississippi! Crowned during the pandemic, Asia Branch, a University of Mississippi grad, has since moved to New York to make the most of her unprecedented reign. Just making sure that I'm keeping myself safe as well as those around me. And so there is a lot of virtual uh, opportunities for me in interviews, just like I'm speaking to you now. And I think that's kind of the new normal as of right now. And so that does make the year look a little bit different. For this queen, making adjustments has been part of life. At age 10, her father was convicted of armed robbery and sentenced to 10 years in prison. It was a very, very difficult time because my father was our firm foundation in our family. I remember that that very same week, I, did, I was like, I have to write him a letter. And I sprayed it with my perfume so he could remember me. That was a very emotional um, experience for me, writing this letter. I was crying. The sixth of eight children, Asia and her family struggled to survive. We lost our home to foreclosure. And, you know, we were struggling to make ends meet. Didn't know if our lights and water would stay on, where our next meals were coming from. Taught about God early in life, her father's imprisonment left Asia angry and filled with doubt. Why would God tear our family apart? Why would he, you know, put us through all of this? Often bullied as a teen, she struggled with her own self-worth. One day, feeling desperate and alone, Asia cried out to God for answers and spiritual renewal. I realized, you know, like I'm in this low place and nothing is going to get me out except for God. And so I, I put all my faith in him and I relied on him once again. And um, I feel like since then I've been able to thrive. She says holding on to scripture was life changing. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, um, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. And I literally, I would write that in all of my notebooks in school. I would doodle it and just really let it soak in because, you know, at the time I had, I had no idea what God's purpose was for me. I didn't understand what was going on in my life. It, it applies to so many different things in life. You know, sometimes we don't see the bigger picture, but if we trust in God in the end, it'll all work out. Now a criminal justice advocate, Asia shares that hope with other kids 
who have parents behind bars. I should have never become Miss USA, but here I am. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what you've been through. You have the means possible to become whatever it is your heart desires. You can be the first in your family to take a good path and then set that example for those to come behind you. Meanwhile, Asia will represent the United States at the Miss Universe 2021 pageant in May. As she prepares for the physical aspects of the competition, she hopes to let her inner beauty shine bright. Having that peace in your heart and that peace of mind um, really can carry you far. And I've really just been focusing on me and, you know, what I want in life, what I plan to pursue, you know, what my heart's desires are and, you know, how I can present that to a panel of judges, how I can help mm. them um, understand my heart and who I truly am and what I stand for. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. You know, it's amazing that the old saying is, uh, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. And I guess that's what happened to Asia. Well, next week is Holy Week, and billions of Christians around the world will celebrate Easter. But was Jesus really the Messiah? Author and rabbi Jason Sobel says the answer to that question is found in the Jewish scriptures. Having grown up in a devout Jewish home, 16-year-old Jason Sobel told his mom what Jewish mothers don't want to hear. He'd come to believe that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. In many ways, the New Testament in my house, porn would be better than finding a New Testament. My parents were like, go meet with the rabbi, you've joined a cult. Now, Rabbi Jason, he seeks to connect Jews and Christians through scripture, as he does in his new book, Mysteries of the Messiah. Well, Rabbi Jason Sobel is with us now. Rabbi, welcome to the show. Shalom. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. You had an encounter with Jesus when you were 16. What happened? Yeah, I was really wanting to seek a relationship and a connection with God. And one day I was meditating and my soul began to vibrate and it left my body and it went into heaven. And I saw this king high and lifted up on a throne in this glorious light, felt the power of God flow through my body. And I knew that king was Jesus. And he told me I was called to serve him. And that began to change everything for me. Wow, at 16, walking that out is quite an experience. You hid some scripture in your home and you mentioned as we watched the video before you came on live today that to have to have new testament in your home was worse than considered worse than porn to your parents after they discovered it how did they react how did you respond Oh, my mom, you know, I should have learned you can't hide anything from your mom, right? My mom <laughs> found the New Testament hidden in my bedroom. She's like, what is this that I found in your room? Don't tell me you come on those Jews who believe in Jesus. I knew you'd do something like this one day and break my heart. <laughs> Go meet with the rabbi. You've joined a cult. Well, you know, I got out my Hebrew Bible and, uh, and I looked every passage that talked about the Messiah. And that really is the background for our new book, Mysteries of the Messiah. Yeah. You had a list of some of the promises and prophesi prophecies of the Messiah. Will you share a couple of those? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that was key on my journey was Isaiah 53. A, friend, a good friend called me up. He said, Jason, could you tell the difference between the Old and the New Testament? I said, sure. He read me, he was bruised for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, by his stripes were healed. And he said, Jason, is that the older? And I said, that's the new. He said, that's the Jewish prophet Isaiah speaking 700 years before he ever walked the face of the earth. Things like even Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent as we're heading into Holy Week. Mm. It just blew me away as I realized that one of the reasons why Jesus had to die on the cross was because the first man and woman stole from the tree. So God put back on the tree for you and me to undo the sin of the first man and woman. Wow. If someone were to ask you today, how do you know that Jesus is the real Messiah? How would you answer them? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I think, 
there are hundreds of passages in the scriptures that give the job description of the Messiah and whether, you know, from where he was born in Bethlehem to his suffering and his rejection uh, to him being called, uh, you know, having to be called a Nazarene, all these different passages, no other person in history, even down to the time that he had to come, Daniel chapter nine is all prophesied in the scripture. Plus, Many people had personal encounters with them and have seen miracles, including myself. Yeah. What happened with your parents? Did they ever come around to seeing things your way or to, to a, a different faith for themselves? Yeah, I mean, my parents are, are very close to me. Uh, you know, my, they come to everything I do. My dad believes parents are on a journey. So it's it's been a blessing, very really close to them. That's wonderful. In your book, The Mysteries of the Messiah, you draw a connection between the fall of man and the resurrection of Christ. Talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said a minute ago, I mean, Jesus is the second Adam and he has to die in a tree because we stole from the tree. So God puts back on the tree. His hands are pierced because our hands stole from the tree. Mm. His side is pierced because Eve, the one who led him into temptation, was taken from the side. His feet are pierced because the first messianic prophecy is that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Satan's like, you think you're going to crush my head? I'm going to mock the promises. I'm going to nail your feet to the cross. He was trying to foil it. He didn't realize he was actually fulfilling it. Jesus had a crown of thorns on his head. Why? What's the curse of creation? The ground will produce thorns and thistles. He's literally taking the curse of creation on his head to break the curse in our lives and restore blessing and abundant life. The symbol is so powerful. You draw another connection between what happened with Moses on Mount Sinai and what happened to the believers in the upper room on Pentecost. How are those two events linked? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Moses... You know, everyone knows the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, Holy Spirit given on Pentecost. That is the same day Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and they hear the Ten Commandments spoken to them. So it's significant that word, the, the Word of God and the Spirit of God are both given on the same day because that connects back to creation. How did God create the world? He, The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep and He spoke. So just like creation came about by Word and Spirit, new creation comes about by word and spirit. And that's what brings transformation in our life. And that's why Jesus says we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. What do you want the takeaway to be for readers of Mysteries of the Messiah? Man, I Part of our passion is we want people to see the Bible in high definition, you know, and we, we want it to come alive so that they fall fall more in love with Jesus, more in love with his word, have that road to Emmaus experience where their hearts burn within them and they see it all come alive in ways they never even imagined, have that sense of awe and wonder. Yeah, there is a sense of awe and wonder when you look at the very big picture of who God is and what he's done and how he's revealing himself to us. <laughs> We want to thank you so much. You can learn more in Rabbi Jason's new book. It is called Mysteries of the Messiah, Unveiling Divine Connections from Genesis to Today. It's available in stores nationwide. Thanks for being with us, Rabbi. Shalom, shalom. Thank you. Pat? I think Rabbi Sobel has got some really important things. What he was saying is just uh, I'm opening for so many people. The whole idea of... Uh, his feet being bruised, and the prophecy said, you know, you'll bruise his head and he'll bruise your heel, the heel bruiser. I mean, it's amazing. So he's done a great job. That, that'd be an interesting book for everybody to get. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. A follow up to a story we reported earlier this week. AstraZeneca insists its COVID 19 vaccine is strongly effective after a government report questioned its research. The drug maker says it recalculated data from that study and concluded that the vaccine is 76% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID 19 instead of 79% that it had reported earlier in the week. Some experts said the new data from the company was reassuring and that the information was likely solid enough for U.S. regulators to approve the vaccine. Well, a Florida couple married for almost 67 years and who spent their lives serving in ministry together 
died earlier this month from COVID within minutes of each other. Bill and Esther Ilniski worked hand in hand in the Caribbean and in the Middle East, then came back to the United States where Bill became a pastor in Florida before retiring three years ago. His wife launched Esther Network International to teach children how to pray. Their daughter Sarah says they were always, always together. And even though it was hard to lose them both, their being apart was unimaginable. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Gerald Clyde is an up-and-coming filmmaker. His credits include blockbusters like The Magnificent Seven Remake and Spider-Man Homecoming. Gerald's goal is to control the airways with a message of hope. So where is he learning to do that? <laughs> you guessed it, Regent University. Regent University student Gerald Clyde is passionate about filmmaking. It started with a Christmas gift he got from his mom when he was 13 growing up in Atlanta. I guess she's seen an interest in movies and um, I like to create little skits. So she ended up buying me a camera and um, surprising me. Gerald's new video camera allowed him to turn his skits into films. First with a short film he made in high school. It was then that he realized he had a gift. At first, I had to question myself. I was like, why am I getting all these creative ideas? Gerald was making a name for himself as the young Spike Lee among his peers. Still, his mom was his biggest fan. She always believed in me and inspired me. And every every video I, I used to put out, she would say, yeah, I told you my baby gonna be a star. After high school, Gerald went to college to study film production. Then just before finishing his freshman year, he received a voice message from his mother's fiance that shattered his world. I heard him screaming, call me now, your mother's been shot. Get to the hospital. Gerald's mother had been bartending at a local bar when someone with an automatic weapon drove by and opened fire into the bar. She and several others had been shot. And when we got there, uh, she was pronounced like brain dead. My thoughts was all over the place. I was angry, I was hurt. The authorities never found the shooter. Wrestling with grief and anger, Gerald took a year off from school to deal with his loss. And he relied heavily on the love and support of his grandmother. It's my granny, you know, it's like, she always been there. Every time I needed somewhere to go, she, she, she accepted me. She always told me, make sure I stay, stay focused, keep doing what I'm doing, because I'm going to eventually get to where I want to be. Through his granny's influence, Gerald turned to God for healing and focus. I started reading and I started opening the Bible more, and I started transitioning my mind. Finding peace and encouragement, Gerald says God led him to go back to school. So he did. After graduating, he joined the Air Force and started working toward his dream. I started working on like uh, motion picture sets like Alvin and the Chipmunks, Baby Driver, Magnificent Seven, Spider-Man. In the coming years, Gerald began working on his own film projects and would also marry his wife, Elizabeth, and start building a family. While Gerald's own film projects began having some success, airing one on Amazon Prime, he knew he needed more education. So he enrolled in Regent University's distance film program to learn more about the business of film. Having worked so long in the secular world, studying at a Christian university gave him a new perspective on himself and the stories he would one day tell. I felt like I was kind of struggling on a battle on a, on a, in the line between pleasing God and making film. Opened my mind up about a lot of different things that, um, that I can put inside of a movie, but I can also relate back in the Bible. Gerald has produced several short films since and is a published author. As he finishes up his degree at Regent, his goal is to create content that honors God and shares his message of hope with the world.
I'm prepared to show in my life and through my craft for the grace of God is give it all that I got. Like not even just film, we do, like we said, books. We put, uh, we gotta control the airways because you know right now it's like the devil kind of got the airways, but if we can control it through the grace of God, through film, through music, through books, through businesses, then God wins because that's, that's the ultimate goal. Well, God bless him. You know, oh, we're going to have graduated from Regent this time about, oh, let me see, about 2,500, 2,400. Wonderful. Yeah, and so there are thousands of Regent people like Gerald out in the world. It's Christian leadership to change the world. Now, we have at Regent, by the way, there's a Bachelor of Arts in Cinema. There's a Master of Art in Fine Arts and Directing. We've got one a program in script and screenwriting, a Master of Arts in Film and Television. And we you have access to about a million dollars in film and video equipment. So you can um, share your artery and art, artistry, not artery, your artistry with life-changing stories. And our graduates, the film graduates, has won over 500 student film awards nationwide, wow, 500 cool. of them. I mean, so they, they, including one of them was the... Uh, the best Oscar, the gold Oscar, and one of them won the silver Oscar. So it's fun. So if, you, if you're interested, here's the number. It's 866-910-7615. Regent University, www.regentedu. So that's just one of the things that is offered at this great institution that I'm very proud of. Okay. Okay. Imagine your daughter's going blind in one eye and she needs not one, but two operations to restore her sight. Then to make matters worse, you have no money to pay for even one of them. A single mom in Honduras was facing that exact crisis. So what did she do? Well, you're about to find out. One thing that eight-year-old Kimberly enjoyed was drawing and coloring. Then she began to notice that her right eye was getting blurry and irritated. I thought there might be something in my eye that was making it hard to see. Kimberly's mom, Carla, noticed that her daughter's right eye was also bloodshot. It seemed like it might be conjunctivitis. I looked, but could not see any dirt in her eye. The next day, she took Kimberly to the doctor. The doctor told me she had a cataract that needed to be removed and that it was a very expensive surgery. Carla's husband abandoned the family seven years ago. As a single mom, Carla wondered how she could raise enough money to pay for an operation. My daughter said, Mom, I want to have the surgery because I want to see. That made me cry because she is my daughter. I ask God with all my heart to heal her. A few weeks after the first diagnosis, Kimberly woke up and discovered that she was now totally blind in her right eye. Her mom rushed her back to the eye clinic. The doctor said now she had a cataract and a detached retina. He said she now needed two separate operations to restore her sight. When Carla said she could not afford either surgery, the staff member referred her to Operation Blessing in Honduras. When I heard that, I had faith that my daughter would see again. I know that God heard us and was opening a door for us. Operation Blessing arranged for Kimberly to receive both eye surgeries for free. The first repaired the detached retina, and the second removed the cataract and replaced it with a new lens. A short time after the operations, we were there as the doctor removed the bandage and Kimberly told us that she could see again. Now I can see again. I can play, run, I can do many things. Operation Blessing is the place where they open doors to help people who really need it. I appreciate your help. You have no idea how much I thank you. 
That's just one thank you from a single mom in Honduras. If you're a 700 Club member, you are doing work like this all around the world every day. We say thank you. What does it mean to be a 700 Club member? Well, it's a commitment of 65 cents a day, $20 a month, and you join with thousands of us who are out to make this kind of a difference in people's lives and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ at the same time. Our number's toll free. That's how you join. It's 1-800-700-7000. You just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. And listen, when you do, we're going to send you as a thank you, Pat's latest gift. I have our latest book and your latest yeah. gift. I have walked with the living God. We have so many wonderful and amazing comments about this. Pat, this is Herb who lives in Winter Haven, Florida. He says, I loved I've walked with the living God. I read it in about four days. It just shows how putting God first results in many blessings. Amen. Boy, that's it in a nutshell, well, isn't it? it? Does, uh... So join the 700 Club because you really can make a difference and we'd love to have you join with the rest of us. 1-800-700-7000. Time for some email. All right, let's go for it. Okay. This is Effie who says, I got into a marriage when I was young and I didn't know Christ. The man is a Muslim. We have had cases of domestic violence occasionally, but he apologizes. He is against me going to church, so I stay at home. He doesn't like me questioning him about finances. He gets really angry. I'm scared to leave because I don't have anywhere to go, and I'm not sure if God wants me to leave or stay. What should I do? Oh. You know, there are organizations that set up for battled wives and people who would help. And in a case like that, I, I think uh, you, you've got an abusive situation. <clears throat> and uh, I mentioned the Pauline privilege. And I, I, I think uh, you married somebody of the other faith, which is a mistake to start with. Uh, you should be compatible with the spouse you have. But the fact that you don't have to stay in an abusive relationship, you just don't. So, uh, I, and I say, you say, where will I go? Well, you can get a lawyer and get some action like that, or you can look for uh, websites for battered and abused wives. They're, they're, they're people that want to help you, mm -hmm. right? This is Philip who says, we know that Judas hanged himself in Matthew 27, 5. Do you think there's a chance he repented before he died and is now in heaven? You know, we have some very uh, compassionate people in this audience. A number of you asked me if the devil will be forgiven. And, yeah. and now they, you know, suicide is kind of final and uh, uh, I, I don't know what went through Judas's mind, but he was so ashamed of what he'd done. He sold out the Son of God for 30 pieces of silver. Then he threw it down because he said, I, I don't want to take it. And then they, they put him in a potter's field and so forth. I, I really don't. How can I tell you? I don't know what went through Judas's mind, but I, I, there's always a possibility. But I want you to know. If any of you are ever thinking about suicide, it's a pretty final thing. And it's pretty hard when you're in the process of dying or right after you die to say, well, please forgive me. It's all over at that point of time. Okay, this is Diane who says, Jesus told us in Matthew 24, 39 through 41, that it is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with the hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. You have said that everyone will be taken when Jesus returns and no one will be left behind. But that seems to contradict what Jesus said. Can you explain your interpretation more fully? Well, what I was saying at, in the rapture, uh, the first thing is when he sent the angels out, the uh, righteous will, uh, the, the dead in Christ will, will rise first. Excuse me. <laughs> the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who remain will be caught up to be with them and the Lord. What happens then? Well, uh, the, the, where do they go? Well, these people left are not going to stay on earth and, and be flying airplanes and all that stuff. They're going to go to their reward too, but the reward will be called hell, <clears throat> and there is no return from that. All right. Deidre says, "What does it mean to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and does it have anything to do with the personal acknowledgement of being convicted of sin?" Well, it does, but I mean, the blood of Christ has to do with His death on the cross. So you say, I'm covered with the blood 
of Christ, it means that his death was effective for you. And I, I don't think we need to, uh, you know, analyze it any more than that. I think that's enough. All right. Okay, Carolyn says, I'm concerned about the United States fitting the description of Babylon. The Bible talks about the destruction of Babylon. Babylon. So destruction seems to be imminent. Is there any way out? Um, I, I don't think you need to set up a theology based strictly on the book of Revelation. And, but I do think that in terms of mystery of Babylon, the whole world is drunk with the wine of her fornication. And so help me, I do believe that the United States uh, can, can be put into that role. We have sent pornography all around the world. We have sent abortion all around the world. We have uh, sent homosexuality around the world. We have sent out movies uh, and, and, and uh, all kinds of television programs that are destroying the, the faith of people around the world. And uh, well, I, I don't know, you know, beyond that, we're going to be made to account for it, but it's not something imminent necessarily, but you don't know. The, the wheels of God's justice grow slowly, but exceeding fine. God will, he's not forgetful. He will remember what's being done. But again, I, I don't think I would build my entire theology on some of the ref references in, in Revelation. Okay. This is Joanna who says, my 21-year-old son bought a lottery ticket for a $55 million lottery. That was two years ago, but he's still believing God will provide him $55 million. He compares himself to Abraham and me to Sarah because I laughed when he told me. He's letting his hair grow as a sign of faith, and it's quite long now. What should I tell him? Uh, I tell him that he's uh, one misled child, and he'd better shape up. The, you know, this isn't the way you get wealth. The way you get wealth is little by little by little by uh, the compounding effect of, of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the law of use. And it isn't a hit on the lottery. It's, that's not the way Abraham got wealthy. It's not the way Isaac got wealthy. He had flocks and herds and so forth, but it was a gradual process. We leave you with these words from Jeremiah, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Thanks so much for being with us. And for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. From CBN Films. In the summer of 1864, one of the wealthiest women in England decided to take a trip. Baroness Angela Burdett Coots belonged to one of the world's oldest banking families. She was a philanthropist to whom Charles Dickens dedicated one of his novels, a London socialite whose circle included the royal family. And without realizing it, she was about to introduce the world to the archaeology of the Bible. Holy Land fever swept through Britain, and the Baroness even convinced her friend Vicky to sponsor the new organization. Vicky was none other than Queen Victoria. And in 1867, the Queen sent a team to Jerusalem to excavate the Church of the Holy Sepulcher and the Temple Mount. Get written in stone, House of David, for a gift of any dollar amount.